Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, and here with me is my co-host, Tho Bishop. Well, we got plenty to talk about this week again. Last week, we talked about the assassination, and this week, we're going to talk about uh, the other party and what's going on, <laughs> what's going on there in terms of uh, just their candidate. And it turns out that uh, they're done with Biden, I guess. And they have uh, thrown him out and replaced him with Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, I guess that's how you say it. Yeah, you don't want to be racist. Uh, right? I, uh, <laughs> I don't. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm misogynist uh, you. This is, well, this is just how much I care about Kamala Harris. I've said her name so mu- so often in the last four years. It's been really important. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, her, uh, or not so much her, as, but as the machine that installed her as the new candidate for the Democratic Party. Uh, but before we, wanna, we get into that, I just want to make sure and mention that uh, coming up this October is our Supporter Summit. And that's where you, as a, a supporter of the Mises Institute, can come and meet your favorite speakers. You can hang out uh, with the Institute at Hilton Head in South Carolina. That's a, it's an excellent resort down there. And you should, you should really join us. This is coming up October 10th through October 12th. And we do this every year. You can't make it next year. Plan on coming next, uh, the, the year after that. But uh, yeah, definitely you should try and join us at one of our future supporter summits. But this year's is uh, beginning on October 10th. You, if you want to go, go to Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, and just click on events. And you can see that there, and you can register. And lots of speakers is a laid-back event. Lots of speakers, lots of different topics to be discussed, and, and there will be time to talk to the speakers offline as well. It's a big, yeah. it's a big speakers. I mean, I, we've got an all-star lineup this year. We've got uh, Tom Woods. He's going to be in the house. We've got Alex Pollock, a Radio Rothbard favorite right there, and also Tom Luongo, who always has something very interesting to say when it comes to uh, financial markets, the, the Fed, uh, the geopolitics of money. So I'm very much looking forward to this one, as well as the world premiere of our upcoming documentary, Playing With Fire, uh, Money Banking in the Federal Reserve, which I'm also extremely excited about. So this is the supporter summit you want to go to. If you're ever planning on going to one, this is this is when should, that should be high priority for any, uh, any Mises supporters out there. Yeah, get with it if you're not already planning to be there. All right, so let's uh, <laughs> let's move on to the events of this past week. And as we, uh, well, though you had a great line where you noticed, you noted that, uh, well, they, they tried to get rid of the other candidate with the assassination and that didn't work out. So they tried some other methods to get rid of the other candidate and that worked. We have a bipartisan deep state right now. <laughs> I mean, that's something that's <laughs> national unity. And uh, I mean, who's they, right? I mean, I guess we can speculate a little bit about that. Uh, but we'll try and stay mostly in the realm of known facts as best as we can, or really just try and look at current events through a historical lens and really just try and and guess what's going on. But also point out how events like these um, have had effects in the past and how they do affect the nature of the regime. Because I think we're seeing right before our eyes a real changing, publicly changing, obviously changing regime in the sense that uh, there, there is little regard for the established law, the established way of doing things. Uh, whereas in the past, of course, they never stuck with, you know, wh- whatever we did 50 years ago, we're going to keep doing that. They never cared about that. But there was concern with maintaining very, very slow change so as not to alarm the public. Uh, but whoever's running the regime seems less concerned now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a speed run. Yes. As the kids say. It's fast days. changes. We're going to do whatever we want uh, as fast as we want. And we're going to uh, cover up uh, the the craziness of it just with full-blown, full-on media propaganda to just tell you that everything's fine and there's nothing weird uh, going on. So let's just let's just begin with, like, really the, the first step of it, which was really just to get uh, Biden to step down, right? Now, of course, there's always this speculation, well, how much does Biden even know is going on? And having not seen him in person, I have no idea. I'm not going to be like one of these 
uh, psychologist hacks who like diagnoses people without ever having met them. So I, I don't I don't know how much Biden goes on. But we do know that Biden and his inner circle, at least the people who really, really have a personal stake in Biden being president, had to be convinced uh, to to give it all up and just step aside and let the party elites install someone new. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we, we hear suddenly, it was all very suspicious, right? And, and a lot of the conspiracy theorists, and when I use the term conspiracy theory, I don't assign any value to it. Like, it's not a pejorative term to me. Um, some conspiracies are wrong, some conspiracies are right, is what Rothbard said, and he was right. So, and I don't know which conspiracies are right uh, well ahead of time, but a lot of the conspiracy theorists said, oh, well, he's going into hiding now because he's got COVID. You remember this last week where Biden says, oh, well, if I had a real medical problem, I would consider stepping aside. And then like three hours later, they announced that, oh, he's got COVID. He's got to go into isolation. So a lot of people were saying, well, that's it. <laughs> he's got his medical problems, so he's gone. We'll never see him again. Uh, and then, sure enough, three days later on Sunday, we get this terse uh, post on Twitter slash X say, oh, I'm stepping aside and I love Kamala Harris. And, and less than an hour after he said that, he like formally endorsed Kamala Harris also on Twitter slash X. So that was that. And then it was just a matter of, OK, well, how do we make sure she gets the official endorsement, the uh, the full on nomination from the party? So now they're talking about speeding up the whole process. We'll vote online. Uh, we'll make sure the superdelegates are all in line. And next thing we know, Kamala Harris will be the official nominee of the party. So that that all happened like within days where that <laughs> no no real debate certainly no public debate on a floor or anything like that. that's how conventions used to work even in the days of the smoke-filled rooms there was some sort of public debate among people who were running uh for the nomination that's all that's just all gone now it's just oh we decided we want to get rid of the the only guy we had in the democratic party who had actually won some primaries and had some sort of uh, endorsement from the overall voting democratic public well, he's out. So now someone who had never won anything in terms of party primaries is now going to be installed. That's now our official uh, nominee. So uh, that's, uh, that's a very interesting way of doing it and something that basically has no precedent, even from the early 19th century when, when party elites chose the nominee. There were still factions. There was still some sort of public back and forth, but that's apparently we're, we're done with that now. Well, it does require us, I think, to have a little bit of, uh, you know, I've been thinking about, because I know several weeks ago after the debate, and you know, we discussed the possibility of this being some sort of 40 chess move, having the early debate as a way of pushing Biden out early and being able to install a favored candidate. And we were both dismissive of that theory. Given the changing of events, I've you know been forced to reconsider that. I still think that the outcome of Kamala Harris being the nominee um, I'm, I'm still a little skeptical of it being, you know, a trust the plan sort of situation there. But it is fascinating to me because what it demonstrated to me, my, the, the, the biggest lesson of the past week is the extent to which true, where does true power really lie? Because you had a president taken down essentially by a combination of the press, um, the donor faction, particularly George Clooney, and the and and really Nancy Pelosi, who even though is no longer Speaker of the House, is still you know the most powerful Democrat. You know, say what you will about Nancy Pelosi, and there's a lot to say about Nancy Pelosi, but like this is someone who has real power, right? This is someone that has power that Joe Biden, even after ascending to the presidency, doesn't really have in terms of controlling the mechanisms of that party. Um, and it's, I think it's fascinating. I'm just, I mean, I think it kind of, this was in Politico, right? So this wasn't like, you know, Alex Jones saying this, but like the, there, I mean, there was reports that she literally threatened Biden with the 25th amendment. Basically we, we can do this the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. Everything up to last Sunday was the easy way. And things were only going to escalate between now and the convention. And so to me, like, I think it's just a, a fascinating illustration in real time of the extent to which, where does true power lie in America, and spoiler alert, right? It's not whoever wins elections, right? You know, there's 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 all sorts of different factions there. 
Um, and now we have Kamala Harris, who I, I think the most fascinating dynamic, and, and there's some reporting out there, again, how much of this is real, how much of it is not, it's, 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 but that, that Biden being so quick to endorse Kamala was a bit of a surprise to a certain extent. There had been reports earlier in the week um, where even while, while some of the timing had changed, a lot of the pieces lined up, right, that Biden was planning not to um, nominate, to, to not quickly endorse and allow the process to play out. One thought process there was, you know, making Kamala actually earn it right through uh, an open process. That's what Obama himself came out refusing to endorse her explicitly, called for kind of an open process there. Um, the other side of it is, of course, concerns or thoughts, um, which have been widely reported for years now, right, that they did not view Kamala as a viable candidate. And of course, all of this is now being completely rewritten as the narrative is unfolding uh, you know, around us already, right? They are literally rewriting news articles from you know, 2019 and 2020 during her first time around. Oh, well, yeah, we're sure. We reported that Kamala Harris was the most liberal senator in America, but we made a mistake and she was actually a moderate and, you can, and, and it's okay for people in Pennsylvania to vote for her. Oh, well, you know, yes, if we, we reported that she was the border czar, but don't worry, it's, it's, here's, here's an editor note, we were wrong about this. Um, you know, this is this Orwellian real-time rewriting of, you know, having the press completely reshape the narrative in real time, again, going to where power truly lies here. And again, this has just been an insane month <laughs> of American politics. I mean, again, I mean, just this, it's just, it's an absolutely insane uh, time. And it makes it difficult to try to, you know, obviously from our perspective, right, we recognize that the, the larger forces at work in America, again, the, the, the decay of political norms, the insane physical situation that America finds itself in, um, you know, all the fundamental structural problems, right? You know, we tend to focus on those things. And then politics is often a sideshow and, it, and the sideshow has never been crazier than it is right now. And it's very difficult to figure out exactly how are these next few months going to go, um, you know, and you try to figure out the signal from the noise um, with this just massive, again, unprecedented, unthinkable, um, you know, sort of, of environment that we have ourselves in. Um, you know, I, I think Rothbard would very much be enjoying this period of time right now if, uh, if he was with us. Yes, this is not normal, right? This is not normal behavior from the American regime. And uh, they're, the fact that they're willing to just put it all out there show, I would suggest a certain level of desperation, uh, certainly would suggest a certain level of uh, institutional decay from within the regime. When, when things are going well, everything seems fine. The right in the mid 20th century, See, the young people, they haven't, they're still buying into this because I've talked to a lot of young people who are, they're not in our group necessarily. Uh, they're, of course, they're not in our group because they were, they're showing these videos where, say, the debate between Obama and Romney a few years ago, there was a video going around and it, sh and it showed like the debate between Trump and uh and Biden, and they're yelling at each other and being real cranky and not being very respectful. And then someone in social media kept uh, sending around this video that showed Romney and Obama basically complimenting each other repeatedly during their quote unquote debate, right? Oh, you know, the honorable gentleman did such, I just want to compliment him on his excellent work, but I do want to have a minor disagreement with him about policy X. And they're saying, see, see how much better American politics used to be? And I'm thinking, no, that <laughs> the reason they're being so polite is because there's no no one in this race upsets the regime in any way. Both of these candidates are approved candidates. Neither candidate cares that much if the other candidate gets elected. And so that's why they can be so polite. That's why American politics was so respectful and polite and gentlemanly seemingly in the 50s. Uh, because there was everything was going the way the regime wanted it to go, and there weren't any candidates that that uh, presented any sort of threat. And the one candidate who did seem like a problem, John F. Kennedy, ends up dead. So, and then we can just go back to being very gentlemanly again. And people fall for that. The reality, however, it wasn't that uh, people. Uh, as somehow had been socialized differently or that uh, there was real choice in the regime. There wasn't real choice. And everything was controlled very, very well, where the media had very tight control of what you were allowed to say in the media. Institutions were very tightly controlled. Public schooling taught you very, very well what you were allowed to say and what you weren't allowed to say. 
And uh, two generations of Americans grew up in that and just bought fully what you were allowed to say and what positions were acceptable. And that's why people seem polite was because anyone who didn't subscribe to that was just cast into the outer darkness and we didn't have to hear from them at all. And so that's why people seem impolite now is because all these other opinions are creeping in and the people in charge hate that. And uh, the, the, it, the whole politeness facade is breaking down. And so when you see people being very aggressive and very rude and you see the regime sort of freaking out and, and uh, resorting to censorship and just doing workarounds on all of the institutions that we were told were necessary for democracy, that's because they're actually afraid of what might happen to the regime's power. Now, are they? is it justified that they're afraid? Is Trump as big a, a threat to the regime? I've noted here before that, no, I don't think it's that big a threat. But, but they can't handle even just a minor threat to things, to the status quo. So that's why they're freaking out. And so when you, when you see things breaking down, that's, that's largely what's going on there. Now, we should note that, okay, well, is it that big a deal that there weren't, weren't uh, primary elections? And so we're jettisoning that stuff. Is that a big deal? Well, uh, potentially not if there were actually, <laughs> if there was the sort of freewheeling politics that there had been in the 19th century when there was the smoke-filled rooms that were choosing candidates and nominees. That was, that, that's a totally different context. What The reason that you had primary elections and, until this year was that the progressives themselves had pointed out that there were a lot of very wealthy people behind the scenes that were essentially choosing the nominees, and so they wanted some sort of uh, election taking place that would determine who was the nominee for each party. They thought that was more, quote-unquote, democra uh, de uh, democratic, unquote, and they wanted it that way. So, and the Democratic Party, of course, then was always saying, oh yeah, we, we want more public involvement. We want more democracy. Of course, we're in favor of uh, these primary elections. Now, of course, the Democratic Party invented the idea of the superdelegates and they've all, always actually had party elite control of who gets nominated. But there was at least a, a feeling that you had to maintain this facade of democracy. But apparently, it's enough of a crisis, crisis situation now that we, we can just get rid of that. All of that stuff the progressives said about primary elections and the need for democracy within the parties themselves, that's gone. And so we don't care what they say anymore. And we're just going back to 19th century, a bunch of uh, powerful people in back rooms pick. And that's uh, really quite a remarkable change, which, of course, it's never announced. It's never made explicit. It's just something that's quietly done and then presented as normal business as usual. And that seems to be what we're looking at right now. And one of the things I think is fascinating about this moment is, for, for, for one, again, just the last four years, I think it, the Democratic Party is a serious political party in the traditional sense, right? You know, it, it is something that's controlled by a, a, a party elite. And in this case, I'm not even trying to use that as a dismissive term, right? But like there's an infrastructure there where they can gatekeep out. They set the rules, you know, the whatever the – everyone else, you, you can have your opinions, you can have your primaries, whatever. But ultimately, the party gets what the party wants at the end of the day. And that is, you know, the well-organized elite minority within it. The Republican side is a husk of a party. That's why Trump was able to win in 2016. Um, it's why Trump was not stopped in 2024 when pe a lot of people would have preferred to have moved on. It's why Trump got his nominees in 2022 and the result is what it is. Um, there's been so co some, co uh, uh, the, the, you know, there, there has been some um, co-opting of, of Trump at times, right? You know, keeping Paul Ryan, things like that. But, but ultimately, those were things that Trump agreed to do. They weren't forced upon Trump. Um, you know, he, he was a part of that process. And what I think is fascinating about this is that imagine if, and I, and then this is of course the, the you know, the, the, the great meme of, you know, conservatism, right? Imagine if it was on the other foot, right? But let's, let's play with that game for a second. Like imagine if Trump had been forced, if, if Mitch McConnell had come in in 2020 and said, we're going to use the 25th amendment on you if you do not remove yourself. And let's say just for this thought process, Trump had agreed to do so. Um, imagine the backlash that would have arisen from the voters of the party, from that base of the party. I mean, there would have been chaos. Um, at the very least, there would have been a massive 
diminishment of voter turnout, right? There, there would have been people that would have forever written off the Republican Party. You had people writing off the Republican Party for lack of adequate defense of Trump after January 6th, right? Um, if, if you know, Trump's presence within the party kept those people loyal to him within that entity. Um, here, I'm, I'm very interested, and, and you know, this is still fairly new. Um, we're going to have a convention in Chicago, which has been the site of some very interesting action in the past, right? Um, I really hope Dan Rather, if, if history rhymes, I hope Dan Rather is there. Um, but the, um, I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, when, when we think about the democratic party, right, we think about these activist groups, we think about, you know, you have your black lives matter folks and you have your strong, um, you know, you have your strong progressives, you have your AOCs, you have these people that have, you know, that, that are, are, are activists, politicians and, and, and large activist groups that have no problem protesting, no problem causing a fit. I'm shocked by the lack of resistance that we have right now from the Democratic base about the way this entire process has played out. The fact that there has been no one stepping up, even if it was a sort of protest candidate, right? I'm surprised that you don't have AOC, for example. I mean, you know, I mean, AOC is kind of like largely kind of fallen. You know, she's been a good team, team player, right? But an AOC type figure, a, a Bernie Sanders, right, representative, right? Like, yeah, that, that's been big talk, right? You, you have this, this massive new generation of democratic socialists, you know, within the party. There, there's not even someone willing to try to just help elevate whatever, you know, the, the, the way that a Green Party does in, in other uh, you know, forms of elections in Europe, right? Having some sort of group that tries to elevate a particular position of concern within this process to, to help. I mean, everyone's kind of falling in line. So far, I mean, again, the, the biggest outlier has been Obama, right? Which is, you know, fascinating in its own right. And and I think that aspect of it, the the extent to which the left, which again we think of as his activist class, have been such willing just to to to, to act conservatively, right? To the, the ne- this this whole next man up mentality, right? Like that is what we expect historically from Republicans, and that is how the radical left of modern America is acting within this process. And I, I think part of that goes to one the the extent to which the uh, uh, left-wing political organization is very well disciplined for the most part. Um, that you ha- you have your your specific leads, right? You know, you, you have your your you know, a- you know a- AOC falls in line, so her people fall in line. Jim Claiborne falls falls in line, so you know you have black churches falling in line, right? And you you have these groups that are very established. You know, they're 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 very good at following hierarchy there, um, which again kind of ironic, um, and. That aspect of it, I, I'm, I'm going to, we'll see in the next few weeks goes, but that, that's something, that, and then the other, of course, the other aspect of it is just the extent to which they built Trump into a boogeyman. And of course, last night we had Joe Biden give his old talk about, you know, explaining why he's not running, except not explaining, you know, kind of mechanisms, right? You know, he did talk about, oh, Nancy Pelosi put the gun on the table. And so I'd said, yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, but like the, the way that the, the, the world that they're living in is so, it, it's such an, it's such a, a, Separate from, from at least my experience, from your experience, from the experience of our audience, right? You know, you listen to Joe Biden talk, and it sounds like we're in some golden age in America, right? You know, crimes at a 50-year low. Well, I mean, part of that's because the FBI doesn't have report crime statistics from major cities, right? So that's that's one way of doing it. Oh, well, border crossings have are lower now than what it was when it took over. Well, it's because we had COVID and, you know, whatever. And, and I mean, we've got to stop this threat to democracy while we are completely changing the, the entire way that this democratic process has gone out. And we have to present, we have to protect our institutions and we're going to change, we're going to try to push Supreme Court reform and things like that, which again, not saying, yeah, I mean, we could talk about Supreme Court reform, but that's not what, yeah, their, their, their goal, right, is to erode that institution because they don't like where it stands right now. And, and so like they, they have this combination of well-organized activists, yeah, they're, they're, their activists are on a leash. They have trained them very well. And on the other side, they have built this entire facade of Trump as Hitler and everything is going great. And it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, these are kind of self-evident observations. I don't, there's not particularly anything profound here, but it's just, it's, it's just worth acknowledging because it's so very weird. Uh, well, just the sheer level of propaganda that you get out of the media, right? With the whole Kamala was never border czar thing. And just imagine if we didn't have Twitter to create uh, and promote all of these posts showing just how absurd that was, right? You don't even have to dig yourself anymore. People just put it all right up there for you. Look, here's the media saying in 2020 that she was border, or 2021, that she was border czar. And then here they are yesterday saying she was never border czar. I mean, it's, it's astounding how any journalist pretends to have any sort of principles or dignity whatsoever. 
these these people who are who function on the political beat there's nothing they won't say no matter how untrue it is and no matter how much how much they know it's untrue and it's really quite remarkable and it just keeps reminding me of the situation in the 70s and 80s in the Soviet Union where the economic situation continued to get worse and worse but they were told everything was fine over and over again. Everything's under control. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. And by then, of course, everyone knew it was all lies. Nobody paid attention to anything that they were told. The black market was thriving. Everyone knew that everything they were told in the media was, I mean, there, some things might be, ac might be true by accident, like it's sunny today. Okay, sure. I mean, I can see that's true. But anything that you can't observe with your own eyes, you should probably assume that is a lie. And it's all in the service of the regime. But in reality, what was happening was deep, deep concern behind the scenes at the Politburo level. And that's just what kind of I started thinking about when I was seeing uh, the chain of events that led to uh, Biden's exit. There was, <laughs> I was reminded of how uh, the, the August coup played out where Gorbachev, he, he goes out of town for a little bit and uh, going out of town. Did he have COVID? That? Oh, did he have <laughs> Maybe at the fl actually, I think he was going on vacation to South Russia, uh, like Sochi, someplace like that. And <laughs> or at least we were told he wasn't sick. Who knows? And he, he goes out. And, and of course, when you're when you're in a shaky position as a chief executive, it's best to never leave town uh, because those sorts of things happen then when you're gone. And they decide, OK, now's our chance. The Politburo thinks, OK, this guy's had too many reforms. He's pushing the new union treaty, which was this treaty to basically uh, get rid of the old 1922 unionist treaty that that centralized all power in the soviet union and they were going to create this new uh, essentially confederation of states that was going to still be called they were they, it was still going to be called essentially this the soviet union of of sorts uh but it was going to be completely different it was going to be this new modern system of republics etc cetera, etc cetera. and the the old hardliners and the Politburo didn't want that so he he leaves and they 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 try to push him out uh and that essentially actually is what uh, pushed out Ukraine and some of the other republics who decided, oh, well, th this, this country is a basket case. So let's get full independence. And the, the treaty, the, the coup actually kind of succeeded on a certain level and that it destroyed Gorbachev po power ultimately. And that, that it's at that point that um, the more local presidents started to take over like Boris Yeltsin and those sorts of guys. But in the, in the bigger scheme of things, it was a failed coup in the sense that it did not reestablish hardliner or Soviet socialist power. But when I looked at the way that it worked, right, <laughs> is we've got these power brokers behind the scene. We've got this, this guy who's, who's the chief executive, the, the, uh, the de jure chief executive. We can push him out. We can reestablish the status quo that we liked, and we can carry on as if nothing ever happened. And that that that's a quintessential palace coup sort of situation, where it wasn't even it wasn't a military coup, it wasn't the army coming in and and seizing control of <clears throat> the imp uh, the imperial palace, the presidential palace, anything like that. It was basically the guys who were already running things. They just weren't the the chief executive, but they were already in charge. They were sharing power. They decided they didn't like this guy, and they were going to push him out. And that seemed to be what what was happening with with Biden. Is we had all these people who essentially were in power, like Pelosi, uh, and and the people at the very tip of the Democratic Party, uh, but they didn't like the person of Biden in there anymore because they felt he couldn't win. Uh, and maybe they just felt that uh, he was uh, just not cooperative enough anymore. So he's out. And this also illustrates for us, and I noted this in my article from Tuesday at Mises.org, is that the person of the president still does matter. In, uh, because we've been told often is that, well, Biden being a loyal soldier was going to agree with everything that the regime told him to do. That was an old lie that they used to talk, tell about communists, was that every communist activist uh, thinks totally is always in total unity with the party and always does what he is he is told, and that is why the communists will win. This is why you got guys like Whitaker Chambers, um, who wrote his book Witness back in uh, I think uh, the early '60s, maybe the late '50s, where he said, "Well, the communists are going to win because every communist in the world is obedient and devoted to the communist project." And of course, that was complete nonsense, right? Individual communists are interested in themselves and their family and getting rich. We saw that in the leadership of the Soviet Union. There was no unity there. They all were, a lot of the times, they were just crooks running their own scheme using the Communist Party to get rich. 
And that's always been how it is. There's never been these political movements where everybody's on board and the individual person and their own interest doesn't matter. And so that seemed to be an issue here is that Biden had his own interest. He wanted to run. He thought he deserved a second term and he wouldn't get out of the way. So maybe they had to use the 25th Amendment as a threat. Uh, at any rate, they got rid of him. But the point I make in the article is that so what when you're the essentially ruling people in that situation, that is these Democratic Party elites, you want someone who's just going to follow orders. You don't want someone coming in who's got his own following, who's got his uh, his own constituency, who's got his own interest groups, who's got his own fundraising prowess on his own. You want someone who you can control. And boy, Kamala Harris fits that bill, right? She's got, she never won any primaries. She's got no constituency of her own. She's got no fundraising powerhouse on her own. She's built up nothing that is separate from what the regime can give her. So her only, her constituency is the regime. It's not the general public. Well, and she also doesn't have a loyal army, right? Like, you know, when you're a senator, when, you, when you're in D.C., you have a staff around you that typically follows you around, right? The people that in, the, in, in Biden's inner circle have been with Biden since, you know, TV was in black and white, right? Like, you know, it, it was an, it's, a, it's a very old guard. Kamala, like, she, 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 she is such a horrible human being, right? I mean, I mean, right up there with Hillary Clinton, just one of these, the, the most, you know, inherently unlikable figures um, to, to be at this level. Um, and, and modern politics and like the, the amount of staff turnover that she's had. I mean, that, that's, that's the funny thing. Like, this, is, this is what's requiring this, this massive propaganda field, right? This, this, this reality bending, you know, sort of uh, is, is, is working on an overdrive is because like everything that you know, there's years and years and years of the same story popping up was just how utterly incompetent her 2020 campaign was, right? And just how horrible she is to work for. Um, you know, it's and like and so she doesn't have, you know, these people that have been working for her for for decades. Right. That would take over as sort of, you know, generals underneath the commander in chief within kind of running the office. Like she has someone who is totally just going to have things planted upon her because she no one wants to work for her. <laughs> and, and then that's that's been one of the other interesting aspects of the entire Biden administration is in these, you know, all these reports that have come out you know, in the last few weeks. Right. It's like the extent to which like Biden hasn't had like a full cabinet meeting in like a year and a half. And, and yet at the same time, you know, you, you've had the Obamas that have never left D.C., which, again, is, is a weird thing, right? Like this, it's worth pointing out that is not normal. Presidents usually leave D.C. afterwards for a variety of reasons, part because, like, who the hell wants to stay in D.C. if you're no longer, like, you know, if, if you do not have power, right, then, then why would you want to be in D.C. unless your aim is to influence power? And that's exactly what Obama was using, his little embassy, to, to have greater control over the people that Biden was not capable of leading. Um, you know, there's another report about how like you know, Biden hadn't had a, a, a full sort of uh, directorate to, um, you know, giving given the party line to Democrat legislators in years because he can't think on his feet and the like. Right. So like that's that's one example of it in the most obscene and just the, the mentally incapacitated Biden, who luckily is still going to be serving as commander in chief for the next six months. And don't you dare question otherwise. Um, we'll, we'll see how that that lasts for another couple months. Um, and then Kamala, who is so unlikable that she doesn't have the sort of enforcers that have the sort of loyalty to do the dirty work the same way that Obama that arose from Chicago's you know, machine style politics and many of the people from Chicago rose with him. Um, and again, that's going to make this entire dynamic of, you know, and again, a, a theoretical Harris regime, you know, inshallah, that will never happen. But like, you know, it, theoretically, like it, it, the, the personality of these particular two figures are also unique in the lack of loyalty of that network around them um, to to actually you know l l utilize these leverage of powers that theoretically would be under the auspices of the president of the United States. The whole thing then just raises the question of who actually is in charge of the executive branch of the United States, right? They, this has been another gift of the last eight years, right? Things have just been so bonkers where with uh, Trump as president, we got to see how the CIA and the FBI really function, that they're deeply political organizations interested in themselves. And uh, so that's been a great thing that Trump uh, inadvertently exposed. Speaking speak of which, did you see yesterday, like the FBI director was literally going like blue anon on saying, oh, well, Trump might not have been shot. <laughs> like 
Well, didn't he say it might have been shrapnel? I, I, it might have been shrapnel. Yeah, I mean, like, he's still like questioning. Oh, you know, he, may, he might not have actually been shot at all. I was like, come on. Like, <laughs> in a hearing. Well, I mean, okay. these people, who knows what these people will say at any given right. minute now? Right. I mean, the wheels are off. Uh, right, right. It's off the rails because I just, I literally don't know what position the FBI will take next week or tomorrow. Uh, or, and I don't know who's going, I literally don't know if Kamala will actually be the nominee at the end of the convention. Uh, she probably will be, but how do we know that they, everybody won't magically throw all their delegates to somebody else because we decided this person. And as you just noted, we don't know that Biden's not going to resign in October or something like that, just to make sure that we have a sitting president in place who's running for uh, re-election. Who knows? And so, so none of this is really predictable at this point. And of course, the reality is that, right, the fact that uh, Kamala's name isn't on some of these ballots in some of these states, right, and say that Biden were to die uh, in October, uh, we, we don't know. Uh, it, there's, it doesn't matter what the actual law says, what the rule says. We know that ultimately when it comes down to it, the parties will just simply said, oh, well, the necessity is that we do X, Y, Z. And we also know the Supreme Court will sign off on it because they always do. They always, the Supreme Court always signs off on saying there's a, uh, there's a state interest in doing X, Y, Z, and they always sign off on it. So it, the, the, they'll never let the law get in the way of their true power brokers getting what they want. Yeah, it'll be a 6-3 vote, but it will be all <laughs> And, and so I'm just, I, that's a question that needs to be answered is, okay, who's making these decisions? Who's actually making the decisions about immigration policy? Don't know. Who actually has the nuclear launch codes? Don't know. Uh, the, the, right. <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't say, I don't think we can say with the certainty that he doesn't have them. And so it's just an open question as to who's actually running the executive branch. And I, the whole thing really just exposes then that, and this has been true for years, of course, and obvious to anyone who actually cared to look and didn't buy the propaganda about how uh, Biden is sharp as a tack and he's never been better. But there's obviously the U.S. government at the executive level is run by some sort of oligarchic group, some group of interests, some advisors, some high ranking people who are unelected. And that's the important part of all of it is that some of them, we don't even know their names. Most of them are, well, all of them are unelected. None of them were elected to the office of the presidency. We know Harris isn't making any important decisions. So what does that all mean? It really just illustrates, too, just the, the lie that, you're, oh, you're voting for this man to be president and he's going to make the decisions based on his character. I mean, who could, who could say with a straight face that character counts? anymore. I mean, the character of the candidate is utterly meaningless. <laughs> but you would have to find out about the character of all these people who's, who are behind the scenes making the important decisions. You have no idea who those people are. And so it's really just it, uh, back. It's to this Soviet-like feel. Of, yeah, it's party apparatchiks behind the scenes who are making the decision. Do you know who they are? Nope. Do you have any influence over the decisions they make? No, not unless you are a millionaire who can write big fat checks and not unless you're high ranking in some important interest group. Those are the people with power. They, the public has been cut out of the equation. The, the, uh, the, the prime, at the primary level, you're cut out of the equation. At even the governing level, after the election, you're cut out of the equation because y y you're sending letters to the president. You think that makes any difference? That doesn't mean anything. And I can only laugh when we still hear from these uh, old-timey conservatives who say, we're a, we're a constitutional republic. We're not a democracy. Well, you're half right, friend. It's not a democracy, but it sure as hell isn't a constitutional republic either. You think anyone cares about the Constitution? Who do, who do you think cares about what the Constitution text says? This is all a ad hoc, we do what's necessary to retain our power stuff. And when you say we're a constitutional republic, you just sound like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> it's not. That's not how the system works. So maybe uh, uh, try c coming into the 21st century and recognize the reality of it. This is a party-controlled system. Them. There are two parties that, that vie for power somewhat because there are different individuals in the different groups and they want, uh, they want their own people to be in power. They want to have direct access to the easy money that comes with being fully in power. But is there any real disagreement on uh, the deeper portions of that regime and that state military power, uh, foreign policy, 
Uh, there's there's broad agreement on those sorts of things. And uh, so it's really just a matter of which guys get access to the spoils of party power right now. And those decisions are being made by people behind the scenes. And you don't know who they are. And uh, what was written in the Constitution a long, long time ago has very, very little to do with it. And, and the entire idea of right of, of political self determination at this point completely out the window. And, and but I, I think that's one of the things that makes you know, like you know, given that we are in a a party run state, I think that makes the institutionally feeble nature of the Republican Party so fascinating. Because what we have seen is that there has been, I think, people that had there there, there have been particular interest groups. Um, that have recognized the opportunity and have tried to step up to fill power voids within the Republican Party. And I think the biggest example right now is what uh, the crypto industry is trying to do. So they kind of realize that, hey, look, we want to have power. If, we, if, we, if we're tired of the crypto industry being under attack, as it has been under, in particular, aggressiveness the last four years, but even the, the Trump administration, not particularly um, good for it. Uh, the tax bill had some bad stuff for crypto. Um, you know, for the most part, the financial regulators were not particularly pro crypto with a few exceptions, uh, notable exceptions, but few, few exceptions there. And so that's one of the things I think is fat. If, if we're looking for, uh, reasons not to be completely black pilled and to, to find, to, to look for interesting opportunities, um, with this dynamic is the extent to which how much is, you know, Peter Thiel's buddies, you know, how much is the Silicon Valley, you know, the Vivek Ramaswamy types, um, you know, people that have the capital, both both literally in terms of money and in terms of influence, right? How much of that is changing? How much of the, um, you know, there's been a, a, a lot of the reliable Republican oligarchs have passed away in the last few years. Um, some particularly notable names within that. Um, now, obviously, their sons, whatever, right? But you, you also have that interesting dynamic where a lot of the kids of traditional conservative oligarchs because they went to high level schools and they, you know, are in socially liberal areas, right? You know, they've and then you you add the 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 odor of the Trump era that has very much turned off sort of a lot of the the Chamber of Commerce style Republicans, um, kind of pushed them elsewhere. Like there is an interesting void within the Republican oligarch class. Um, now that doesn't mean good is going to come out of it, but it, it's an interesting dynamic there and something worth, worth monitoring going forward. And I think that the, the J.D. Vance selection is a is, is an illustration of that. Where Vance has a lot of very bad ideas, but he also is, you know, I think, distinct from, let's say, a, a Mike Pence or, you know, some of these other, you know, you know, a Dick Cheney or even a Dan Quayle, if we want to go back that far. Right. And so so because of the extent to which we are a party controlled, you know, not an individually controlled, um, the presidentially controlled um, executive branch, federal government, if you will, um, you know, given that dynamic and given you know, the institutional erosion that we have talked about when it comes to the Republican Party, like just what comes out of that, what, what does this actually end up maturing into in the future is a, a gray area rather than just the, um, you know, everything kind of already being baked into the cake as it has been for several decades now in American politics. Yeah, I agree. There's reason to not be totally black pilled, right? There are there are uh, there's a significant Relative. and gr gr <laughs> well, right? There are people who recognize that the the regime is illegitimate at this point, right? Stop pretending like it is. Stop uh, uh, stop speaking well of these people. Stop acting like things are running like they're supposed to be. Stop pretending that there's some sort of rule of law. Uh, there isn't. That's gone. The stop paying lip service to this regime. Um, and some people get it. And I would say Ramaswamy does a pretty good job at actually really kind of approaching that issue and just talking about how screwed up everything is and that these people hate you and they're against you and you don't have to give them your allegiance and their respect in return. And a lot of other people are saying that as well. I don't know what Ramaswamy's endgame might be, but he's pretty good, I think, at really sort of indicating without coming straight out and saying it that he thinks the people who run the U.S. government just aren't. Uh, right, these aren't honest, good people, uh, and they want to destroy you in many cases, and and that's the proper interpretation, I think, for many people to have. And yeah, a lot of the Bitcoin people understand that, but that's the only way you're going to actually see any change is when you get 
a uh, enough of a critical mass of people who just stop pretending that everything's fine and that the rules are being followed and uh, that you, you, whoever wins the next election, you have to treat them as the, the legitimately elected person through uh, of the United States and that he's our president. And th they continue to speak of the regime as if it's theirs, right? We are at war with X, Y, Z. Well, who's we? I mean, the, the regime is doing all these things, but the regime doesn't doesn't reflect your values. The regime doesn't care what you think. The regime is continually um, cutting you out more and more from the process to ensure that you have less and less say. I mean, you had barely any say before anyway at the president at the presidential level. You had one one hundred millionth of a vote. Uh, actually, even smaller than that. Yeah, it means you don't matter, is what that means. Uh, uh, but apparently, you matter too much because they're trying to cut you even more out of that process. But a lot of more and more people are realizing that. But progress, I think, will only be made once we can get rid of the people still thinking that uh, there's a rule of law, that it's a it's a it's an American republic. That uh, there's just some bad guys trying to ruin it. It's gone. It was ruined long ago. So time to get with the times and appreciate that that uh, action needs to be taken to rebuild or not even rebuild, just build something that actually works and limits regime power. Uh, and that's just the first step. Unfortunately, a lot of people still haven't come around to that. And so we do have a long way to go. Yes, we do. But uh, and, and again, again, this is just July, Brian. <laughs> this is just <laughs> July. I know. It's amazing what could happen in August, September, October. I have no idea. And I'm not even going to attempt to predict what might happen. Also, here's something that we just haven't even talked about lately. What's up with the economy? What's the economy going to be oh, doing? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Remember that? Remember people's jobs and employment situation and how debt we're already seeing it crystal clear in terms of the people on the fringes, right? That is younger people who don't have a lot of capital, who don't have high incomes already. They're already delving into the abyss in terms of their incomes and their debt levels and all that. And that also always starts out on the fringe of the most economically disadvantaged people and it works its way in. And we're already seeing it at work. How long is it going to take? I don't know. So that, that adds another element to it is can the regime still tell us how great the economy is and how we're living in that golden age that Biden seems to think we're in? Are they going to still be claiming that in October? I have no idea. I don't know what the, how well they're going to be able to cover up the actual economic situation at that time. So yeah, you're right. The fact that it's only July is quite, quite an interesting uh, element of all of that. At least we'll be here covering the circus as, uh, as time goes on. And with that, we better wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbarn. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with more, so we'll see you next time. <laughs>